I was in a darkened room on my own, unable to eat or drink because my stomach was paralyzed, unable to sleep, unable to tolerate anyone's presence in the room, unable to bear any light or sound. I was blindfolded, I had earplugs in. I was just waiting for the end because it, it wasn't an existence that I was prepared to put up with for much longer. It seems the world wants to forget and move on from the pandemic. But the estimated 65 million people living with long COVID don't have that choice. Hello. Hi, oh, welcome. You're, you're wheeled in. I am indeed. Yes, this is how we get about. Wow, so just what to restrict the walking? To conserve energy. Dr. Asad Khan is a respiratory physician. He contracted COVID-19 in November 2020 while working on an acute respiratory COVID ward. A month later, he developed long COVID. I've likened this to a bomb exploding in the body. That's how it felt. I developed a whole host of new symptoms. Chest pain, breathlessness, confusion, drowsiness, rapid heartbeat, palpitations, passing litres of urine, um, sort of in one go, um, being up all night peeing, um, burning when you go to the toilet, a horrendous rash that covered my entire face and neck. My eyelids were so swollen that they shut, I couldn't see. Long COVID is a condition comprising often severe symptoms that follow a severe acute SARS-CoV-2 infection. Long COVID's incidence is estimated at 10 to 30% of people who were not hospitalised when they had COVID, 50 to 70% of hospitalised cases, and 0 to 12% of vaccinated cases. Long COVID is associated with all ages, but the highest percentage of diagnoses is between the ages of 36 and 50 years. But more worryingly for sufferers, doctors and scientists don't fully understand this multi-system condition. I ended up in hospital a few times. You go there, they do some standard tests, they tell you that there's nothing seriously wrong, maybe you're anxious, maybe you're worried about the lockdown situation, maybe you're stressed because of your work and you know, the toll it's taken, and I was like, no, this is not the case. I'm actually seriously ill here. But what I find strange about your story is that you're a doctor telling other doctors what you're feeling and what you're going through, and they're not even believing you. Oh yes, we are no exception. I was told to my face, with this rash creeping all over my face, that I was probably over-perceiving my symptoms. I actually did think about ending my life, not because I was depressed, because uh, I don't know what depression is like, this was purely because the physical symptoms were unbearable. Um, and uh, I rang up Dignitas in Zurich and um, I terminated the conversation because I thought this is probably not the right time, the, the children are too young. But maybe if they're 18 and this is still me, then yes, I will not be carrying on like this. Progress has been made in identifying the abnormal changes in body functions that are the causes and consequences of long COVID and risk factors from other health issues have been identified. But there is no unifying long COVID theory. There are a number of hypotheses as to what causes long COVID that overlap, including persistent virus infection, autoimmunity, reactivation of latent viruses, and chronic inflammation. But many sufferers still struggle to find help and answers, and like Dr. Asad Khan, turn to each other online. Asad also did his own research, working with clinicians and researchers around the world. One of them was Professor Rishia Pretorius, who, with Professor Douglas Kell, were the first to come up with the hypothesis of microclots in the blood. Over the past years, I've been looking at blood clotting and how various diseases are affected when there are inflammatory molecules in circulation that causes the blood to clot abnormally. Uh, so it was right in the beginning of 2020 when COVID hit us with the first variants. It was quite interesting for me to hear from my clinical collaborators that were at that stage working in the ICU that they have been seeing acute COVID patients and that they have been um, finding coagulation pathologies. 
process of blood clotting or coagulation prevents excessive bleeding when a blood vessel is injured. When an inflammatory event occurs, it begins what's called the coagulation cascade. Small blood cells called platelets activate and combine with proteins, including the soluble protein fibrinogen, which converts into fibrin, which forms a net to clot the area and capture inflammatory molecules, which in a healthy person are broken down. But during, for example, COVID-19 infection, platelets are exposed to inflammatory molecules, including the spike protein on the outer surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and become larger and more active in the circulation. The spike protein also interferes with the structure of fibrin proteins. They become misfolded and malfunction. The fibrin and other misfolded plasma proteins form insoluble microclots that, together with hyperactivated platelets, can damage endothelial cells that line blood vessels, block blood flow to many organs, and the microcirculation that can result in the constellation of symptoms some experience. Long COVID is also just a perpetuation of damage that was caused initially during the acute phase, where you have platelet hyperactivation and microclot formation, and that all driving um, significant endothelial damage. Now, with that taken into consideration, there are a lot of other things that might happen. There might happen autoimmunity or immunity, and we also know that viral persistence are all playing into long COVID. And all of those things happen during the acute phase and then progress into a persistent disease of long COVID. Your hypothesis is microclots, but there's not one main hypothesis, is there? One would be ignorant if one suggests that only one hypothesis is a uh, is the a hypothesis. What I would want to rather suggest is that all of these different hypotheses that every research group have started off with while they studied long COVID, the viral persistence, play into one unifying hypothesis, which I think is widespread vascular damage, having an effect on all organ systems, where the microclot and platelet hypothesis is only one part of the full story. You can't have the one without the other. The professor's research is informing the work of clinicians such as Beata Jaeger, who started treating long COVID patients early in the pandemic. Those people who do not daily deal with long COVID patients have no imagination how severely sick some of these patients are. They are also minor cases and mild cases, no doubt. But those who are severely handicapped, for those patients in the economic level, in the social level, and in the medical level is not done enough by far. Dr. Jaeger recently moved clinics to expand the long COVID treatment she could offer. Clinic St. George, south of Munich, has a history of treating a range of diseases and has a waiting list for long COVID patients. American Suzanne Arthur-Jones is being treated for Lyme disease, which also has a post-viral syndrome. She's been shocked when meeting long COVID patients. I had no idea how sick people were with long COVID. And I mean, they are sick. And I've been sick over the years, in bed a lot. But they are, I think they're the sickest. We have cancer, Lyme, and long COVID. And I just didn't know. Assad's friend gave him his place on the waiting list. When he arrived at the clinic, he had a blood test and this large clot was removed from his arm. When he finally saw Dr. Jaeger, she gave him several treatments, including putting him on a machine to remove excessive fibrin blood microclots. She said, right, you cannot wait another day. In fact, the clots were so bad that I kept blocking the machine at two litres, when normally you're able to wash three and a half, four litres of blood. I made some modest gains in that I was able to sit up for longer um, and uh, able to think a bit more clearly. Uh, the constant chest pain that I had, it lifted a little bit, but it was very slow progress. The machine that removed the clots is called an apheresis machine. The machine sucks the blood and then the first step 
is plasma separation. So you separate the blood cells from the blood plasma. You give the blood cells with saline directly back, so you do no harm on the blood cells themselves. And then to the plasma, you add an excess of heparin. Heparin is a well-known medication that works as an anticoagulant, but it is also an anti-inflammatory stuff, and it's also an antiviral stuff. And in case of COVID, it's highest interest because it covalently binds the spike proteins. These machines exist in Germany since almost 40 years. We traditionally use them for the treatment of uh, high-risk patients with coronary heart disease who have suffered several myocardial infarctions or being heart transplanted. So these machines, they clean the blood? Yes. They clean the blood, essentially? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, they remove excess damaging stuff from the blood and they do it in a harmonized manner so it does no harm to the patients. Not all patients need apheresis, but those that do may need several sessions. Yvonne is starting her third session today. Yvonne, when did you get long COVID or know that you got long COVID? Ooh. One year ago. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting ill, like an infect or something else. I don't know what it was. Then it was clear that it was uh, long COVID. And so what were the symptoms? Oh, fatigue syndrome and um, my lung function was at 35% and now after one year it is over 60% with under uh, steroids. And so have you noticed a difference? Are you feeling better? All of these therapies, epheresis, the um, oxygen therapy, all of these therapies are very, very exhausted for my body. So at the moment, I don't know if it works so good, but I hope so. The, in the first filter, the plasma is going to be separated from the blood. Then it goes to the other filters and there all of the cleaning takes place. And then it goes all the way to the back and uh, the patient gets his rest of the plasma back. And this filter now, which is yellow, it's getting to be like filled with plasma. Long COVID treatment can be as complex as the disease. Before apheresis and often after, patients are prescribed anticoagulants, also known as anti-clotting drugs. They may also take natural supplements, as well as using physiotherapy, hyperbaric oxygen chambers and cryotherapy. Dr. Jaeger sees the microclot hypothesis as a key part of explaining the damage long COVID inflicts on the body. I think it's an important part because the clotting system is the quickest, but this does not rule out uh, the whole reaction of the immune system that's included. And I personally think that we should look at the, at the body f uh, at a holistic perspective. And it's an evolutionary process. It, all the infections go along with clotting activation and inflammation, and this together speeds up an immune reaction. But it all takes place in the blood, and we see that the microcirculation is clogged, is not working. If we have a new problem, we have to find new ways. This should be supported by governments and also by colleagues. We need studies, of course. There is no one theory or way to treat long COVID. Instead, at Clinic St George, Dr Beata Jaeger is treating the symptoms she sees using proven methods and repurposing drugs. I think information is one thing, but the tools for a correct diagnostics are difficult to get because the common routine tests were all showing zero. I have mainly seen young, sportive, athletic people approaching me, children. Of course, also people with comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension. Before any treatment is prescribed, the patient has blood tests and their medical history is reviewed. 
Professor Pretorius and her team developed a way to image the clotting abnormalities using fluorescence microscopy. Renata Boyens is a former student of the professor and has come to the clinic to help with specialist diagnostics. We separate the blood into two parts called the platelet poor plasma and the hematocrit. Um, and it's basically just the platelet poor plasma has all of the coagulation proteins and fibrinogen that we want to look at and endothelial cells. And the hematocrit contains all the red blood cells and the platelets. So usually in the most basic microscopy techniques, you see everything that is on the slide, but with this you can pinpoint specific images or structures that you would like to see. It uses fluorescent markers that highlight activated platelets and the misfolded fibrin, presented as microclots seen in acute and long COVID patients. So the misfolded structure has like little cavities, and this dye binds to that cavities, and that's how we can distinguish between, you know, is this a misfolded protein or is this a functioning protein? Because the functioning protein you won't see on the microscope. So what's this image telling you about the patient? So in essence, uh, this place patient is highly coagulable at the moment and the platelets are very activated and that's a clear indication of high inflammatory molecules, infection and illness. <laughs> Renata showed us the images of a patient's blood before and after treatment, and you can see the difference in the amount of microclots in the blood. Assad saw a 50% improvement after his first aphoresis sessions, but was reinfected and had to go back for more. He's been reinfected many times. I didn't have the same gains that I had the first time round, though, I have to be honest. And I think part of the reason for that is that I had some further reinfections. And then my last reinfection was August 2022, and I've more or less plateaued since. So what percentage would you put yourself at now? Oh, I think now I would say I'm 40%. He's grateful to have received help at the clinic, but there are critics who question the use of apheresis and other treatments. There are some who consider the drugs and treatments used for long COVID are experimental because clinical trials haven't been done. What's your response to that? Now, I'm not a clinician, so I cannot report on safety or what a clinician should or should not do. Until there are clarity on what exactly the treatment regime would be, clinicians are trying their best following clinician-initiated treatment regimes. Many of these medications that they use have been used very safely in other types of diseases where there is clotting pathology or too high cholesterol levels or for help apheresis, for example, that we know that's where it's typically used for. Instead of criticising the clinicians for using various treatment options, we should be thanking them for trying something because the rest of the clinicians who are sitting on the sideline and criticising are doing nothing. More accessible diagnostic tools are needed. In Dr. Jaeger's department, students from Professor Pretorius are experimenting with what's known as a flow cytometer. It's a prototype developed at the Max Planck Institute. If successful, this will be more affordable for those working with COVID patients. So the fluorescent micros microscope uh, was sort of the first, one of the first diagnostic tests for COVID and long COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, since then, we always try to improve our diagnostic tests, of course. And and this is a, a prototype flow cytometer and it basically simulates blood throwing, flowing through a vein. And what it does with machine learning and all of the engineering parts of the machine, it detects how much red blood cells, microclots, white blood cells, all of those flow through um, the vein. And then with that, you, we can also use a diagnostic test to, it's a bit more quantitative um, where the microscope is a bit more qualitative. And does everybody have these microscopes, you know, the microscopes that you're using here? I mean, this one is starting to be and might be uh, a bit more common. Uh, the limitation that the fluorescent microscope has is that you, you need specialised training in order to get accurate results and not be too subjective. And um, not everyone has, you know, access to, to that training and to, and to the microscope itself. It's also quite expensive equipment. How many samples would you do like this a day? So I think in a day, currently, we just do as much as we do in the microscope, which is between 10 and 
12, 14 samples. But uh, eventually when, when this technology is perfected and optimized, we can do up to 30 or so samples a day. Professor Pretorius has been working to adapt current diagnostic techniques so labs and clinics can apply her research. We've just published a paper in Hillion, one of the cell journals, where we showed how one can actually do the microclot testing using an imaging flow cytometer. That way we hope to make the testing more available to regular pathology labs because most pathology labs will have a flow cytometer, obviously not an imaging flow cytometer, but we had to start somewhere because we needed to develop a method, a cell-free method to detect microclots in plasma. So we hope that all of these various initiatives over the world um, are having some momentum where clinicians are finding that they would want to test for microclots and platelet hyperactivation before they want to decide on which treatment regime they should embark upon. Back in the clinic, 12-year-old Hanno's parents have driven seven hours to see Dr. Jaeger again. He first got COVID-19 in 2021 and ended up bedbound. He was able to return to school after treatment, but some symptoms have returned. I've removed my finger like this. I want you to follow my finger. Good. This test is done to see if the conjugate eye movements okay, are, are there or not. It's called it binocular vision, like when you see a horse race, okay, how the both lens move together. So in, in some cases of neuroinflammation, you know, and, and brainstem inflammation uh, or, or uh, involvement of the part of the brain known as cerebellum, a jerky eye movement can be there. It may be causing him to feel that the stairs are wavy when he's climbing it or coming down. But in his case, okay, appears to be a milder brain inflammation of its meninges or stuff. And if we keep him on some uh, anti-inflammatories, okay, I think that, which actually, of course, reach the brain, okay, which is going to resolve the issue very shortly. Dr. Manan Baig is a neuroscientist from Pakistan who's come to work at the clinic. He was the first doctor in the world to link loss of smell and taste as a COVID symptom. Recent studies have shown the virus can damage the brain during infection. Now we know that it's a multi-system, multi-organ disease, and the CNS, the brain, the spinal cord, is a very special target of this virus. The reason every second patient that I saw today with Dr. Beate has got neurological deficits, cerebellar dysfunction. So if this virus is causing neuroinflammation, it's causing direct neuronal injury that need to be fixed. The bad news is that uh, we are not getting very well funded in long COVID. But if we make more delays, you know, now, I, I said that you will have disabilities, okay? So I call it a 2D effect, okay? Disabilities, you neglect them, okay, and then that is a big deal. Dr. Baig and Dr. Jaeger are working on five papers about their findings. Three of them are being peer-reviewed. I think this is a task that is not only humanitarian, but it's it's... It's essential to keep our societies going on because the economic impact, we only see now a little glimpse of uh, it will become a disaster if we do not bundle all our en energies to, to find this wonder drug that might cure COVID. I, I, from a scientific point of view, I doubt that one single drug will do the job. Um, um, I think that uh, that there should be much more funding and much more interdisciplinary co-working. I think that's the only way how we're going to try to figure out this disease is if we work together and understand what each of the research groups are working on and how we can assist each other and join forces because we know funding is a massive dilemma. There are not many fun funders or funding agencies looking into long COVID, unfortunately. So the, the few sources that we have, we need to pull and to work together. And that's exactly what's, what's happening. The long-term prognosis for ASAT is unknown. 
He barely has enough energy to take his daily medications. There are these two boxes. So for every day I've got before breakfast, yeah. with breakfast, after breakfast, before lunch, with lunch, after lunch, before dinner, dinner, and post dinner. When do you have time for food in between all these pills? There isn't much time. And are all of these drugs or are there supplements in there as well? There are drugs and supplements. The idea behind this is that um, th there are a lot of mineral deficiencies that you get in this condition and I have a few, so it's aimed at replacing them. The problem with some of this medication is that it doesn't get absorbed into your body. So what I then have to do is that I have to use up my nose um, or have to drink and some stuff they have to apply to my skin. This is very rich in certain minerals. This provides an alternative route. When medical students take the Hippocratic Oath, one of the promises is to first do no harm. But from Dr Khan's perspective, not taking long COVID seriously enough won't just harm people, it will continue to ruin many more lives. We don't fully understand the long-term impact of this virus, but what we do know is not good. We know that it increases the risk of heart attacks, Parkinsonism, stroke, diabetes, blood pressure problems, premature death. So the problem we have with medicine is that everything is dependent on huge randomized controlled trials, which obviously take a long time to set up and to deliver results. And when you have so many people sick at once, we don't have that timing. Um, what we need really is um, to use the evidence that we've got, which might not be the best quality, but it is still some evidence, and have discussions with patients about the risks versus benefits of certain treatments and offer them those treatments. So what gives you purpose now? I, I mean, for me, obviously, this is personal in that I've had my life ruined by this. Um, that's one way of looking at it, but obviously it's focused me on what's important, but also my son has a condition. And I don't want him to go through what I've been through. But also, I feel like this happened for a reason. And hence, I've immersed myself into the research. And I've worked closely with Dr. Yeager and with Professor Pretorius. I mean, whilst ill, I've achieved six or seven peer-reviewed publications because I already had the skills of networking, of having a presence of social media, that this happened to me so I could actually use those skills um, to raise awareness and to push for a better deal for those with invisible illnesses. Um, like long COVID, like ME, like fibromyalgia, like Lyme disease, and many others. All the people in this film believe that although the world may not fully understand this disease yet, this shouldn't stop improving funding and support to improve the diagnosis and management of people living with long COVID.